So what I'll do is I'll speak for about I'll speak for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And we'll have ample time for questions and answers. And the absolute cutoff is 8:30. Yes. Sir. Okay. So I'll make sure that I won't uh, overstep the time. Well, you know, in the uh, 10 years that I was minister, eight years that I was minister, uh, I had occasion to pilot three pieces of legislation, three laws. The first one, and all the three of them actually proved very controversial. The first one was the National Green Tribunal, <coughs> which you must be reading about every day in the newspapers. The second one was uh, the Land Acquisition Act of 2013, which replaced the 1894 Act. And the third one was the reorganization of Andhra Pradesh to create the new state of Telangana and the new state of Andhra Pradesh. So what I tried to do in uh, the book that's just been published, which is called Legislating for Justice, is to give a background as to why the second law, which was the land acquisition law, why that came into being how it came into being, the process of making the law, and justification for the provisions that today are the subject of intense political debate across the country, which I'm sure you must be reading and seeing on television as well. So let me begin by saying that for 119 years, we had a colonial era law, the 1894 Act, the Land Acquisition Act, which governed all land acquisition in the country. And the fundamental premise of the 1894 Act was a very simple premise, which many of you must have read about, uh, would have been exposed to, which is the principle of eminent domain. The principle of eminent domain in simple English is that government has the power to acquire any land at any price from anybody at any point of time for any purpose. Well, that's in simple English. Uh, lawyers are known to convert simple English into very complex language. Uh, and eminent domain is a very complex way of expressing uh, what I put across to you very simply. The Land Acquisition Act of 1894 was not just a Land Acquisition Act. It was actually a legislation for expropriation. Because land governments could really expropriate the land in the name of public purpose, in the name of urgency, at any compensation for any purpose. It served as well. The city in which we live in uh, was built on the 1894 Act. Uh, many cities grew, many industries came about. And one can't say that the 1894 Act did not serve the cause of industrialization or urbanization well. But somewhere in the mid 90s, somewhere in the mid 90s, farmers got wise to the inequities that were being perpetrated on them in the name of land acquisition. And across the country, you had a spate of agitations, of protests against land acquisition. The most visible of these protests, Singur and Nandigram in West Bengal, Kalinga Nagar in Odisha, Tappal and Bhatta Parsol in Uttar Pradesh, and many other such instances uh, in states like Gujarat, in Andhra Pradesh, and so on. Then there was this massive land grab movement in the country in the name of SEZs, the Special Economic Zones. Massive amounts of land got acquired for special economic zones, got acquired at below market rates, and got acquired very often forcibly because the landowners did not want to part with the land. So if you really look at that period beginning somewhere in the early 90s, it builds up the protest movements in the country against the application of the 1894 legislation begins to acquire very sharp political focus. And that's when the government first thought about amending the 1894 Act and soon came to the conclusion that a simple amendment would not be sufficient, 
What you need is to replace the 1894 Act, lock, stock and barrel, with a new piece of legislation. So in 2007, the first moves to bring forward this legislation were initiated. And they were initiated in two different streams. One stream was to replace the 1894 Act for purposes of land acquisition and another stream to come with another law to govern <coughs> rehabilitation and resettlement. India does not have a law governing rehabilitation and resettlement. We have a policy for rehabilitation and resettlement, but we don't have a legal framework which ensures entitlements to people who get displaced. And so for the thinking in 2007 was we should have two laws, one law for land acquisition to replace the 1894 Act, which will deal with the issues of compensation, and another law which will deal with resettlement, rehabilitation and resettlement, which is an inevitable consequence of land acquisition. So these were two streams that were started. But pretty soon it became very clear that you cannot really divorce R&R from the post, from the process of land acquisition. That R&R is and land acquisition are two sides of the same coin and that when you acquire land a lot of people get displaced not only landowners get displaced those of you who are from West Bengal will recognize that the entire Singur agitation was not so much about compensation to farmers as much as it was compensation to tillers people who were tilling the land although the ownership of the land was not with them so the debate was who gets compensated, not only whose <coughs> lands get acquired, who are owners of the land, but also those who lose their livelihoods as process of acquisition goes on. So the thinking was that we should merge these two. So by 2011, when I became the minister, we had a fair degree of discussion and we had decided that we will come up with one law which would deal with land acquisition processes and the same law would give legal entitlements and legal backing to rehabilitation and resettlement, which is an inevitable consequence of land acquisition. And therefore, you have this 2011 bill that was introduced in Parliament. From 2011 to 2013, uh, there was an intense nationwide debate, political debate. Uh, the bill went to the Standing Committee. The Standing Committee of Parliament deliberated upon it for 14 months and finally uh, on the 29th of August 2013 the Lok Sabha passed the bill and on the 4th of September the Rajya Sabha passed the bill and on the 5th of September this became the bill became an act and so therefore you had this new law a long title the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act, and there's a story on the title which I want to tell you very shortly. Uh, and this, uh, the bill got converted and this act came into being. Now the story in the title is this, that in 1894, the title was called Land Acquisition Act 1894. So the objective of that law was to acquire land. But the story in this title is right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, r and &R. So the, the objective is not the acquisition of land per se, but the fundamental objective that is enshrined and embodied in the title is fair compensation. It's your legal right. It's a justiciable right. You can go to court if you are aggrieved. And it's not only the right to fair compensation, but it's also a right to r and &R, which is defined in the Act. And it's also a right to a demand transparency in the process of land acquisition. So the title is a very significant, it's a long title, very long tongue, tongue twister, many people may not even remember the title, uh, it's not easy to remember, but it's important because the title embodies the real purpose of this act. So we went away from an eminent domain principle of 1894, which gave unfettered powers to the governments to acquire land to a law in 2013, which actually recognized the legal right of landowners and livelihood losers to get compensation and to get R&R. Now what's 
the fundamental difference between the 2013 law and the 1894 law. The 2013 law has four major pillars. There's a consent pillar. There's a social impact assessment pillar. There is a compensation pillar and there is an r, &R pillar. So these are the four in the language of constitutional law, the basic structure of the 2013 law, the basic structure is got four pillars, the consent pillar, the, uh, the social impact assessment pillar, the compensation pillar and the r, &R pillar. Now very briefly, I'll just be very briefly almost telegraphic in my description. The consent pillar says that you cannot acquire land for private companies or for public-private partnership projects, the PPP projects like Delhi Airport and so on, unless you have consent of landowners, unless there is a written consent of landowners. This is to avoid the Nandigram or the Kalinga Nagar type situation where land was acquired forcibly, people actually died in the process of land acquisition, police had to resort to firing, 12 people for example died in Kalinga Nagar in Orissa when land was being acquired for the Tata steel plant there. And in Nandigram, uh, land was being acquired by the government, West Bengal government. And Nandigram ultimately proved the, to be the Waterloo uh, as far as the CPM government is concerned in West Bengal. People had actually, I think three or four people actually died in police firing. Now, so the consent clause was that unless you have uh, the permission, unless you have the approval of the landowners, you can't acquire land for private companies and for PPP projects because the profits that accrue to such projects are not in the public domain, do not accrue to the public exchequer, but are appropriated by private economic agents. So 80% in the case of private companies and 70% in the case of PPP projects was the consent pillar. The social impact assessment pillar is very important and that is really Really, if you ask me, the fundamental difference in philosophy between 1894 and 2013 lies in social impact assessment. What the social impact assessment does is that within a period of six months, before land is acquired, the Gram Sabha has to conduct a social impact assessment of the land that is being acquired. Now, one of the things that I found when I was environment minister before I was rural development minister is that before you set up an industrial project, you have to do an environmental impact assessment. And guess who does the environmental impact assessment? A steel plant coming up, the steel owner, the, the person who's putting up the project does the environmental impact assessment. So Jindal putting up a power plant in Ratnagiri, which is going to destroy the mango orchards there, uh, is being asked, is asked by law to do the environmental impact assessment of his project. And it's no surprise that environmental impact assessment turns out that the project will have no uh, deleterious effects on the environment. So the fundamental thing that we tried, which we did in social impact assessment was, social impact assessment should not be done by the party whose land, who's acquiring the land. It should be done by an independent third party. In this case, because it was an elected Gram Sabha, the democratic institution enshrined in our constitution, the Gram Sabha was given the right to do the social impact assessment. Why is the social impact assessment necessary? Number one, because we found that governments were acquiring land for public purpose and diverting that land for private purpose. It happened in UP, for example where land was acquired in the name of public purpose for industrial corridors or for power plants or for steel mills, but was actually being diverted for private builders. So diversion of land was taking place. A second reality of land acquisition has been in our country that where you require X acres of land, you end up acquiring 5X or 6X, sometimes even 7X acres of land. So excess land ends up getting acquired. The social impact assessment was meant to ensure that this does not take place. Thirdly, multi-crop irrigated land, which is essential for food security in our country, gets routinely acquired. Singur, for example, in Calcutta, near Calcutta, was an example in Bardwan district, was an example of land that is triple cropped, which was being acquired for producing a nano car, which can perfectly be put up and manufactured on barren, you know, waste land. But no, it was multi-crop culture, multi-crop multi irrigated land that was being acquired. So in order to ensure that multi-crop irrigated land does not become first resort, 
but becomes an acquisition of demonstrable last resort, the social impact assessment was introduced. And fourthly, to identify those who lose land as landowners as part of the acquisition process, but also the people who lose their livelihoods as part of the acquisition process, the social impact assessment was introduced. So the social impact assessment has four objectives. One, to prevent diversion of land. Two, to prevent acquisition of excess land. Three, to ensure that acquisition of multi-crop irrigated land doesn't take place. And four, the identification of livelihood losers and land losers takes place in an objective manner before land acquisition takes place. Because one of the principles of this 2013 law is that when you acquire land, not only landowners, but also livelihood losers are entitled to compensation and r, &R. Now, this is the philosophy of social impact assessment, and this is the second pillar. The third pillar is the compensation pillar. The, most of the protests that are taking place, continue to take place today, is because farmers feel aggrieved, that they feel that they are not getting market rates for their land, that they, 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 they get a pittance of a compensation, land value then appreciates, and then they do not get any benefit of the appreciation in the land. I'm sure the land on which your university is situated uh, was acquired at dirt cheap rates. You've added a lot of value to this land, but that additional value has not accrued to the original landowners or the livelihood losers who formed part of this community 20 years ago, or 25, maybe 30 years ago when this land was first acquired by the Delhi administration. So compensation, how to make compensation more attractive, more realistic. And what this 2013 law does is that it enhances the compensation for land acquired in rural areas four times on market rates and double the rate in urban areas. And there is a sliding scale from urban to rural, rural four, urban two, and there is a sliding down scale that is determined by the state government. And fourthly, as I mentioned to you, is the R&R provisions. There is a very elaborate section in the law which says that when you acquire land, the following are the R&R entitlements of the people whose land is being acquired. They can't be displaced without ensuring proper rehabilitation and resettlement, both of the monetary kind as well as the physical kind. So these are the four foundational principles as far as the land acquisition law of 2013 is concerned. Now, land is a state subject. Those of you who are familiar with our constitution, land is a state subject, but land acquisition is a concurrent subject. It's in the concurrent list. And therefore, it is because of the concurrent nature of land acquisition that this law was introduced. Now, what does it mean when a subject is in a concurrent list? It means that the central government can pass a law and so can the state government pass a law. And that's why you have all state governments also having land acquisition laws. But if there is a conflict between a central law and a state law, the central law predominates over the state law. The state in a concurrent subject, in a concurrent jurisdiction, the state law can add to the central law, cannot derogate from the central law. So, for example, if the compensation is four times in the central law, state government can't say compensation is two times. The state government can say compensation is six times. If the consent requirement is 80%, a state government can't say that the consent requirement should be 70%. Consent, they can say, is more than 80%. And that's what Mamta Banerjee has done. She has said that land cannot be acquired for private companies in West Bengal unless 100% of the farmers give their consent. So that's an improvement on the 2013 law, which is basically inherent in the concurrent jurisdiction of this legislation. So this legislation fulfills a long felt need of the farming community that they need to get compensated adequately, handsomely, sufficiently, realistically for the lands which they are parting and as most of you know all of you know the only form of social security in our country is really land people don't have anything else except land and therefore 
when they are giving up their form of social security, they expect some compensation and some assistance in the matter of rehabilitation and resettlement as well. This law has come into being on the 1st of January 2014. It got notified on the 1st of January 2014. Uh, and then subsequently, of course, a lot of debate took place because governments changed uh, and the new government has a somewhat different approach to land acquisition than the principles uh, that are embodied in this law. Uh, to cut a long story short, of the four foundational principles or pillars that I enumerated, the amendments that are now being proposed by the government do away with the consent pillar, they do away with the social impact assessment pillar, but retain the compensation and the RNR pillar as enshrined in the 2013 law. So of the four pillars, two pillars retained, two pillars substantially, significantly modified. In fact, one of the pillars, in fact, eliminated itself. There are other provisions in the law, particularly the retrospective application of the law. Now, this is a very interesting legal issue. I'm sure experts, your professors will, will get more and more, uh, 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 they would explain this to you as you go along in your course. Law is always prospective. Law is never retrospective. But this law is actually a retrospective. There is a very important retrospective provision. In fact, you know, the Vodafone case is a, is a, has been described as tax terrorism because it applies taxes retrospectively. And this was, this, this was uh, described as tax terrorism by Mr. Jaitley when he was in the opposition. But now that he's become a finance minister, he has indulged in the same form of retrospective taxation for other companies. Now, but generally speaking, generally speaking, uh, a sound legal principle is law is meant prospectively. Law never gets applied retrospectively because that becomes discretionary, it becomes non-transparent. However, one very important provision of this law, section 24 particularly, deals with the retrospective application. And the, the reason why this retrospective application was applied is because there are a large number of farmers in India, large number of landowners, whose land was acquired under the 1894 Act, who had not accepted compensation, whose land had not been physically taken possession of. And the big question was, what do we do with these farmers? And therefore, what this law says is, for those farmers whose land has been acquired under the 1894 Act, but who have not accepted compensation, who have, whose land has not been taken physical possession of, they would be entitled to compensation and R&R &R as per the 2013 law. This has been upheld in the Supreme Court in a number of decisions uh, from January 2014. But now the new government wants the law to be prospective and not retrospective. It does not want to reopen the floodgates for those farmers, for those lands, which have already been acquired. So therefore, whose land has been acquired, you have to be satisfied with the compensation under the old act, which basically was compensation decided by the collector or the state government, as may the case may be. Let me end by saying that this, the, this legislation is for land acquisition, not for sale and purchase of land. If you want to buy land, you're free to buy the land. If you want to sell land, you're free to sell the land. But if you want government to use the power of the government to acquire the land for yourself or for some other purpose, then you have to follow a certain legal discipline, a legal protocol that is embodied in the 2013 law. No country in the world has a land acquisition law. Most countries in the world are based on market transactions of buyers and sellers of land. India is one of the few, perhaps one of two or three countries in the world, which has an elaborate land acquisition law. And the reason for that is because of land holdings are fragmented. We have land mafias. And the titles to land in India are not conclusive titles. They are basically presumptive titles. So till our land records improve, till our titles become conclusive, not presumptive,
till our mutations become online so that you know who is the true owner of the land uh, the Oberoi Hotel for example many of you would have seen the Oberoi Hotel uh, in near the golf club there's a huge dispute going on as to who owns the land on which the Oberoi is situated and the Delhi Waqf board believes that it owns the plant and it is entitled to compensation and this has been a case that's been going on for the last 40 years, 45 years, and such examples are numerous across the country where the ownership of the land itself, to begin with, is disputed. So under these circumstances, some legal provision is required uh, to enable acquisition. But I think we need to move on a trajectory that uh, 10 years from now or 15 years from now, all land transactions become market-based transactions. People who want to buy the land, go and buy the land. People who want to sell the land, sell the land to buyers of land. And you don't really need an acquisition law to kick in, except in perhaps the rarest of rare cases. And that's really the philosophy that is underlying the 2013 law. What the 2013 law does, increases the cost of acquisition. It increases the time of acquisition to make acquisition a less attractive proposition as compared to going and buying the land. So if you really want quick land, if you want a cheap land, comparatively speaking, you go and buy the land. But if you want to acquire the land, if you want the land to be acquired, then you have to go uh, through the law that has been passed by Parliament. I think what I want to convey to you is that lawmaking in our country is not a legal tunnel vision. Lawmaking has a social dimension. Lawmaking has a political dimension and lawmaking has a participative dimension I and mean, involve as many stakeholders in the process of formulating laws. For too long in our country, laws have been formulated behind closed doors. And the 2013 land law acquisition law is an example, there are some other examples we can get into, of a legislative process which tried to open it up to as many stakeholders as possible so that the interest groups are, have an opportunity of saying what they have to say and ultimately government and parliament in their wisdom, collective wisdom, pass the law. This law incidentally passed unanimously in both houses of parliament. You wouldn't know that it was unanimous if you look at the newspapers now because there is a huge debate that's going on. Uh, but you know, one of the beauties of parliamentary democracy is that where you stand depends on where you sit. So, you know, if you're sitting in the opposition, you have one view. When you're in power, you take a different view. My party is also guilty of it. So all parties of guilt are guilty of this phenomenon of, you know, changing your views depending on where you sit. But if you read the debates, and I urge you uh, to read the debates that took place on the Land Acquisition Act, a uh, very rich debate, I mean, as rich as any other debate, perhaps the constituent assembly debate, although the topic is limited to land acquisition, but you know, it went into the nature of agriculture, nature of farming, the need for land for urbanization, the need for land for uh, industrialization. One member of parliament actually waxed eloquent on Dobi Zameen, uh, which was a very famous Hindi film, which many of you may not even have heard of. It was a big hit. Bharat Sani hit in the 50s. Uh, it, it epitomizes the pain of small landowners in our country. It was called Dobi Ghazameen. Uh, and there's a huge, you know, in the debate, there is this great discussion on Dobi Ghazameen uh, and what it means for Indian farmers. So it's the nature, how you make the law is as important as the law that gets made. How participative you make the law, how democratic you make the process of making the law, how consultative you make the process of making the law is as important as the finished product itself. And that's really what I want to close with because I think uh, as all of you uh, are, are going to be lawyers either in the public domain or in the private domain at some point of life, uh, I wanted to give you a, a flavor of how complex lawmaking is because it's, it means balancing different strands of view, different interest groups. And if you really want a law uh, that meets the tests of social justice, 
like the land acquisition law of 2013 tried to do, you probably end up not having balanced satisfaction, but you probably end up having balanced dissatisfaction. You end up by displeasing all sections. And if you ended up displeasing all sections, you can be pretty darn sure that you've done the right thing. This land acquisition law, for example, was criticized by industry associations on one side as being too restrictive for industrialization and urbanization. It was also criticized by Medha Patkar uh, and many other law school professors, Kalpanak Kannabiran, for example, from Nalsar, or ex of Nalsar, who said that this law was not progressive enough. And so therefore, I, somebody asked me this question. I said, look, if I have managed to displace a uh, displeased CII and Fiki on one side, and Medha Patkar and Kalpana on the other, you can be sure that this 2013 law has some merit in it. So you know, it's, it's, this is the danger in the middle ground approach. You have the danger of being run over from both sides. But in complex social issues like land acquisition, in complex situations where multiple objectives are involved, such compromises are inevitable in the process of making the law. So therefore, I would urge you to look at the 2013 law, whatever be your <coughs> value system, whatever be your bias, many of you may think that this is not progressive, some of you may think that this is far too restrictive, but whatever your preconceived notion or the notion that you will ultimately end up having, view this as a process, view this as an innovation and in governance of making a very complex law in an area which uh, has really become a very emotive social issue. It's becoming a defining political issue of our times. And I think in the months to come, this debate will only accelerate. So thank you.